All right, so welcome back. Uh, in the last episode of this three-part series adapted from my public lecture, we talked about the copyright, the commons, and how that has played out with regards to classic texts like the Iliad and the Odyssey. So just to recap, we've discussed where copyright came from and what it does. We've discussed the commons and traced the ways in which works in the commons offer up opportunities for new stories. And we've recognized that we have this tension. And copyright and commons both push and pull on creativity. So let's talk about that fourth C of the presentation. Oh, looks like it found us. We have apparently been censored. So what do we do about that? Well, that could be a possibility. And it looks like somebody ruined it for us. Um, apparently, I have some very naughty viewers. But moving right along. So how do we feel about censorship? In the United States, generally, we do not like censorship. We find it problematic in the, con in the modern context. Uh, this is one of the challenges we're grappling with today as we reconcile people with a hateful and violent agenda in whether they deserve censorship or not. So with the First Amendment, we're disinclined to oppose censorship in any official capacity with certain limits. Even in the 20th century, though, we've seen several censorship laws enforced and even industries practicing censorship upon threat of government censorship. They include the film, code, the film Hayes Code, the Comics Code Authority, and written materials that are covered under the Comstock laws that, are out, that came out in 1873 and are still effective in, in some states today. So censorship is a tricky thing, and I'm certainly not going to argue for it, but the idea of restriction can in fact make us incredibly creative. You don't think so? When we have rules, rules that we don't want to follow, we find amazing ways to get around them. How many of you have siblings? How many of you have been told not to hit your siblings at some point? And despite being restricted, how many of you still found ways to bother your sibling? We all do, right? I mean, we all played that game. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. As we held our hand just millimeters from their face. Or the one that my brother loved to play with me, stop hitting yourself, as he whacks me with my own hand. I know when we were kids, we were amazingly creative in bypassing the law, the rules we were given. Heck, when I was seven years old, I was told I wasn't allowed to walk out of my bedroom door because I got in trouble. So what did I do? Yeah, I jumped out my second story window. So restrictions can make us think outside the box, or window as the case may be. We see this within poetry. Everything from sonnets to limericks to haikus, they all have restrictions on what you can do. And from that, we get amazingly creative works and powerful works. In music, we limit songs to three or four minutes, and we continually come up with music that many of us enjoy. So restrictions, which in essence is what censorship is, do have an interesting effect on us. And this is true for the 20th century as well as the 19th century. In the West, we had this serious, and still do, have this serious obsession about sex. We are so obsessed about it, we don't want anybody to talk about it, right? We're so weird about it, we decide that it's easier to tell children that we somehow, that tell children that somehow a bird with a giant mouth flew us and then dropped us down a chimney, chimney like a coconut carried by a swallow, rather than saying we came out of a woman's vagina. Think about that. Yes, Junior. You came from a flying bird delivery service. It was like a primordial Uber Eats program, but with birds dropping babies, like bombs. And particularly in the 19th century, at the birth of mass printing, writing, was, writing about sex was frowned upon and, yes, censored at times, or had to be attacked in indirect ways. Censorship by the publishers and censorship within the courts. So what do we mean? So, so what did that mean for the stories that we tell? Sex was everywhere. Seriously. Because they could not talk about sex, they tried to find ways to instill it into literature everywhere. It's not directly in plain sight, right? But peel back the subtext of many a story, and yeah, 
literature was often obsessed with sex. If you don't believe me, then be sure to take some literature courses. And if your professor doesn't bring up all the sex that's going on in these stories, then you definitely need to ask for your money back. One of the places that to find stories that are all about sex without ever having to be about sex are vampire stories. As sex symbols, they gained popularity in the 1800s. Most of us know about Bram, Bram Stoker's Dracula, but its popular predecessor was Carmilla by Joseph, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. In both cases, we see the seduction and hypnotic trance of young women who inevitably become tainted by their encounter with the vampire. And yes, vampires are great vehicles for sex when you're not comfortable or able to talk about sex. Why not? They're eternally youthful, they prefer the dark, and their means of infecting you or making you impure is by penetrating you with their phallic fangs. It's a very intimate interaction. And the result? You, became, you become pale, ill, and may die, which means you've got yourself a sexually transmitted infection, or you live to feed on others and therefore breed more vampires. And so here's where you discover why vampires make you rich. They are monsters from the commons that largely represents sex, and the funny thing is, we humans are interested in sex as much as we are in stories. Put them together, and you've got yourself, you've got yourself triple word score on Scrabble, or for those that use your phone, words, words with friends. So take sex disguised as horror and make it freely available, and sure enough, people will want to use that as a vehicle for storytelling for well over a century. And that brings me to point number two in this series. Censorship can produce fascinating ideas that stick with us long after the censorship has gone away. That's not an endorsement of censorship, but an observation of it. When censored, humans still find ways to circumvent it. Would vampires be as popular today if writing about sex was not censored in the 1800s? Think about the thousands of books, comic books, movies, short stories, podcasts, and video games that feature vampires. Everything from Count Choc Chocula in Sesame Street's The Count, to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, to Twilight, to Van Helsing, and much, much more. But of course, censorship in storytelling is much less pre prevalent than in the past, but vampires are still popular. So, now that you have found out how vampires will make you famous, Next time, we're going to take a look at how the Hulk will get you sued. All right, that's all for today. What did you think about this argument? How is this discussion, or this uh, how is this discussion, or, or this discussion with uh, coupled with part one, made you think differently? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so be sure to post them in the comments below, or hit me up on Twitter at Leeton01. That's L-E-A-T-O-N zero one, uh, and I'll see you with the last with the last episode in this series. And keep popping, keep thinking.